Hello and welcome to part four of my series comparing the DCS and IL-2 Spitfire Mark 9s. In this particular video we're going to be looking at ground handling, the takeoffs, we'll take a look at throttle prop and mixture control and the engine torque effects. Let's take a look at ground handling in the IL-2 Spitfire. And before we begin the test, I just want to discuss a couple of quick points. The first is that despite controlling for the ground surfaces in these two tests, we can never be quite sure whether it is the aircraft or the aircraft module that we're testing when we do ground handling or whether it is rather the way the sims model the ground surfaces. The second point I want to raise is that in real life, sitting in one of these aircraft, you would feel physical forces on your body. And in particular, as the inertia or the momentum of the aircraft started to change, you would feel that through the aircraft seat into your body before the aircraft physically started moving. Because we're simming on computer screens, we don't know that the aircraft is moving until we see it visually. So we get the information from the aircraft that it is about to move or it is moving much later than you would as a real pilot. And therefore, sometimes our actions occur too late and it feels like we are chasing the aircraft around, whereas in real life you would be much more able to anticipate the aircraft's movements. That said, let's jump in and begin a test. Sitting in the cockpit now, I'm on full fine pitch with zero throttle and I'm just going to confirm the brakes are fully off and the flaps are in the up position. The first thing I'm going to do is just pull the stick back here and advance the throttle. I'm going to advance the throttle quite slowly and I want to take note of when the aircraft starts to move, that is when it overcomes its stationary inertia. And I want to just note what your impacts we see, which way the nose swings as we begin to move forward. In IL-2, however, we do have an issue with the boost gauge, and that is that you can apply throttle from the zero position, and it takes a considerable amount of time before the boost gauge will actually begin to move. So you don't necessarily get an indication from the boost gauge at what point the aircraft is moving, and therefore it's a little bit difficult to compare like for like with DCS. What I am going to do is rely on the HUD and as you can see I just advanced the throttle a little bit here and in the right hand corner or the right hand side of the screen you can see that the HUD is telling me I have set the engine to 5%. I'm going to very slowly keep advancing that now. 6, 7, 9%, 10%, still no movement in the aircraft, 11, 12, 13, it feels like the engine's just dropping down a little bit, it's just pulling, 14, 15, and there we go. So, a very, very small amount of forward movement, and to the left. Now we're picking up pace, so I'm going to just put some right rudder in. Okay, we'll leave it on 15%, which is the engine boost at which point the aircraft started moving. And I'm just going to be putting in a little bit of right rudder here to keep us pointing in the right direction. The brakes remain off and I need about 50 to 75 percent right rudder just to kick every now and then to keep the aircraft pointing at where I want it to go. You'll notice that we're going pretty quick. This is probably close to a fast run or a sprint. So I'm going to bring the throttle back to about 10 percent just to try and get ourselves moving at a fast walking speed. That speed will come down now. I'll apply a little bit of brake just to hurry that process along. Okay. Now we're at fast walk. And I need about, yeah, about 50% right rudder just every now and then to correct the nose direction. It's quite handleable. It is not getting away on me here. It's, um, almost docile and provided I keep the speed nice and low. I'm looking over the left, left wing here. The reason I'm doing that is because it's quite easy to judge your speed. You can see the left wing tip tracking past objects. 
Now I'm going to conduct a 180 degree turn. So just touching the right rudder in small increments and then bringing the rudder back to the stationary position. And she's going around quite nicely. Now she's starting to just ground loop a little bit. So now I need the brakes. Yep, we are actually in a ground loop now. There we go. The brakes on by about 60%. So we've just spun through about 360 degrees. And that's just applying a little bit too much right rudder. So it breaks off again. I'll need to throttle back up. I'm just bringing the nose around to the right and then back down to about 10% again. We'll see if we can get the trundle happening. You notice that the aircraft bounces around quite a bit. And that is sort of the perhaps the ground surface or it might be a sort of scripted animation. Now I'm not entirely sure. If I look from the external views it's very hard to tell if it is the ground that is causing the aircraft to move around like that or whether it is a scripted animation that will just always do that. I'll bring the camera angle lower and it's very hard to get a completely flat camera angle. The wheels do appear to be dipping below the texture here and there and sort of rising above it. So I don't think that's being caused by actual bumps and divots in the ground, but I might be mistaken. It does seem to me to be a scripted animation, but I could be wrong. In any case, whatever it is that's doing it, it does look and feel quite realistic. It does feel like I'm taxiing this little tricycle landing gear down a rather bumpy surface. The last thing I want to do in this test now is just throttle up and I want to see how the aircraft behaves as we get close to the airspeed where the tail wheel will rise. So I'm just going to position the aircraft at the end of the runway again and we'll try a straight run with a bit more throttle. Okay, flaps up full fine pitch and brakes off. What we'll do here is stick back. I'm going to throttle forward slow up to about 35 or 40 percent, try and get to around zero boost on the boost gauge. And we're just going to see how the aircraft handles and how much control input is required in order to keep it pointing effectively down the center of the runway. So starting to move now. And as we discussed earlier, little pushes of right rudder, quite minimal. I'm not actually required to use any left rudder at all. Okay, we're rolling at a good speed out. I'm going to start advancing the throttle. Still very controllable. Now it's becoming a little harder to control, but I think now the aerodynamics of the aircraft have taken over and I'm no longer required to use any rudder at all. I can now just heave the throttle forward and pull the nose up. We've actually gotten ourselves airborne. I'll pause it there because my intention was not really to conduct a takeoff there. So for the first 20% or so of throttle or boost pressure up to about minus two pounds should we say I'm required to just put in fairly regular right rudder inputs as the speed comes up to the point where the tail is about to rise the aircraft no longer needs any rudder inputs it actually holds its heading by itself and even then slamming the throttle forward through its full motion to full throttle there are no torque effects that you need to deal with and there didn't seem to be any other aerodynamic effects that I needed to deal with. The aircraft just held its heading and as you saw we lifted up off the ground. We'll now move on and look in DCS. Let's conduct the ground handling test in DCS on the dirt. You may notice though that this is not just dirt. This is in fact a sort of muddy dirt surface with the metal mesh plates that the allies used to create the advanced landing grounds so it's not exactly the same surface as we have in IL-2 but we should try and make some comparisons in any event sitting in the cockpit with full fine pitch the flaps are in the up position and the brakes are off I'll just bring the stick back and we're going to start advancing the throttle and we can use the boost gauge in DCS because it gives us instantaneous and fine needle response as we move the throttle forward so, begin that process now. Okay, engine's throttling forward. 
starting to rock a little bit. And we've just started to roll forward a fraction. And there's the left nose swing. I've got full right rudder in. And in fact, once the nose starts swinging, it's not possible in this Spitfire, even with full right rudder I had on there, to arrest the nose movement. So once it starts getting away on you, it's actually too late. In IL-2 I was able to correct for the movement. In fact, I was just putting in right rudder every now and then. But in DCS I have to use the brakes a bit more. And there you go, it's already away on me. So I need to put in some brake. And the brake just slows down the nose movement. These are differential brakes. So you can actually put the brakes on and just juggle them like I'm doing here. I have the brakes assigned to a slide so when I'm taxiing in DCS I keep my left hand on the brakes lever, the brake slider and as you can see the lever just behind the spade grip is just moving up and down and you can also hear the hydraulics hissing. So when I'm taxiing in DCS I'm constantly manipulating that brake. As the aircraft starts to move and the nose starts to swing with the yaw the brake comes on and I apply rudder. As the aircraft then starts slowing down, I remove the brake and we start rolling forward. So I'll try and get us into a fast walking taxi. And I'm kicking both rudders, left and right, a little bit here and just touching the brakes in order to keep us pointing in the right direction. A bit more throttle. So once you've mastered the technique of applying the brakes, it is easy like the IL-2 Spitfire. However, it does come as a bit of a surprise to you when first learning this aircraft that it is very hard to arrest the yaw without the brakes once the aircraft starts to ground loop. Get up a little more speed now and we'll try and bring the aircraft to a tail up position. And now I can just use right rudder and a little bit of brake, but not terribly much. A bit more right rudder there. And now the aerodynamics are taking over and the tail wheel will come up. And if I jam the throttle forward, it gets a little unstable. But it's not quite as forgiving as IL-2, but the difference is quite subtle. It's not like one of these is incredibly easy to handle and the other is incredibly difficult. They do, for me, tend to display fairly similar behaviours. The main difference between the two is that in DCS you are required to bring in this brake lever in order to taxi. You can't just rely on the rudders, whereas in IL-2 you can rely on the rudder for your taxiing. You may have seen that there was very little bounce around. I'm just going to quickly have a look at that sort of bouncing on the rough surface now, which will be the last part of the DCS dirt ground handling. So taxiing along the dirt here, and you'll see that there's fairly minimal bouncing around. Now this surface is pretty flat because of that mesh. There aren't really divots and bumps in this dirt surface. And we don't really see any wobbling and bumping around of the nose like we saw in IL-2. I'll just go externals for a second here. And you can see the aircraft is actually taxiing along fairly steadily and flatly. I'm going to go onto the grass now as well. And we'll see if we get a different response in terms of wobbling about. That's a very smooth transition to the grass surface and there is no real change in the aircraft's connection with the ground, shall we say. So I think in IL-2 they've got that sort of wobbling motion, that bouncing about. In DCS it's all rather smooth. Taking a look now at the IL-2 Spitfire on a concrete or tarmac surface, we are at Krasnodar and there is no wind. It is mid-morning and clear. Just checking that prop is full fine, flaps are in the up position and brakes are off, which they now are. So we're going to just taxi forward, same way we did on the dirt. Very gentle application of boost to begin with, with the stick in the fully back position. 
and we are moving forward earlier. We started rolling at about 11%, so just a little bit earlier than we did with the dirt surface. And we'll roll along here in a straight line. And little kicks of right rudder, just as before. Now the aircraft's not bobbling around quite as much as it did on the dirt, so that may suggest, in fact, that they've got a nice sort of system of modeling that stability versus the smoothness of this surface here. I'll allow the throttle just to come up a fraction and we'll taxi a little bit quicker. My rudder inputs are not nearly as frequent here as they were on the dirt and they're not as strong either. But much lighter rudder inputs, in fact I'm needing to use left rudder here, left and right rudder. So in fact I'm just juggling that rudder left and right a bit more than I was on the dirt. I'll now throttle back. Oh yeah, quite a bit of rudder required to the left here to stop that nose swinging to the right. That's possibly the torque coming off. Wow. Now that was quite a strong spin around to the right. That's just from taking that throttle off. And I put about half the brakes on, but it wasn't enough to arrest that. As you can see, I've lost the left aileron. I have put a nice crease through the wing by I imagine breaking the wing spars. So there we go. I think there is um, a subtle difference between the dirt ground handling and the concrete down ground handling, and that's a nice little touch for immersion. Going to take a look at the DCS Spitfire on concrete here. We're at the Krasnodar Center airfield, and with the prop full forward. Flaps in the up position and the brakes off, we're just going to taxi now. And we're looking to see if there are significant differences between how the aircraft taxis on this surface. Right, getting away there, there's the left yaw which I'm just correcting with some brakes and right rudder. Feels pretty similar, I must say, on the concrete. It's quite a smooth experience still, but it was quite smooth on dirt, so I'm not expecting this to be terribly much different. Got a good roller going on now. And now I'm going to roll off onto the grass here on the Caucasus map in a bit of brakes here just to slow us down so we don't ground loop. And onto the grass now. And there's a significant difference. As we went onto that grass, we in fact went up and down and on the grass the aircraft is bouncing and wobbling around this is much much better and you can see it there looks very similar to I'm back to ground loop here external view is very hard to control the aeroplane okay it looks very very similar to IL-2 when we're on the Caucasus map when we transition from the concrete to the grass so this is that note that I made at the very start of the first part of this ground handling test that it's not always clear whether we're testing the module in this case or whether we are testing the surface or the map and for me this indicates that in fact the Normandy map has a different kind of airfield surface to these Caucasus maps because on Normandy taxiing on the grass everything was completely smooth and like a billiard table there was no difference between the dirt and the grass whereas on this Caucasus map transitioning from the concrete to the grass there's a dramatic change in the aircraft and you see that similar sort of bouncing and wobbling that we saw in IL-2 so bear that in mind when conducting this kind of test is that sometimes you are not testing the aircraft sometimes you are testing the map I'm now going to look at takeoff in the DCS Spitfire to start with. We've already kind of done some accidental or inadvertent takeoffs in this video, but I want to be a bit more deliberate about the takeoff sequence itself in this section. I'm going to conduct two tests with each aircraft. In the first test, I'm just going to try and conduct a normal ta takeoff going through my normal takeoff procedures for the aircraft. 
In the second test, I'm going to try and mishandle the aircraft and to see whether it's still relatively easy or not to get airborne. In both cases, as usual, I'm going to be doing a running commentary as I go through. And hopefully this takeoff test in particular will show one of the reasons why I prefer to do running commentaries rather than write a script and then read it out over the video footage. And that is because I want you to get a feel for the thought processes and the workload that I'm having to deal with during these sequences. And hopefully by verbalizing what I'm doing and thinking, you will be able to get a feel for that. Let's go to the cockpit. I'm sitting in the DCS Spitfire and there's a few things I need to do here before I actually begin my takeoff roll. Possibly the most important is to set the trim. The aircraft does not spawn with the trim in the correct position. In fact, it's plus two notches above neutral. So I'm going to trim the nose down so that it's about 0.5 above the neutral position. That's about the takeoff trim I use. If you fail to set the trim, as soon as you get airborne, the nose will balloon up. I'm also going to set a little bit of right rudder trim. There we go, that's set now. And confirming that my flaps are up, full fine pitch, and the brakes are off. So what I do is I advance the throttle fairly slowly, and I really try not to advance it beyond 8 pounds boost. That way I get a nice smooth power on, and it makes for a stable takeoff. I'm going to raise the seat now as well so that I get a better forward view out over the nose and I keep the canopy open for this. I want to try and get the tail wheel up as soon as possible so I kind of force that situation a little bit by applying some nose forward. The control column will be in the fully back position for the start of the takeoff roll and then I'll try and force the nose into a level position. Then I'm just correcting the last little bit of yaw before gently coming back on the stick to bring the aircraft to the nose up position at lift off and then we should need just a little bit of rudder adjustment as we climb away. That's the theory, let's try the practice. So stick back, power's just going on now, a little bit of right rudder, anticipating right rudder and if you anticipate in fact you don't need the brakes so there we go, no brakes required. Power coming on zero pounds, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder. Come out to eight pounds now, a little bit of left rudder there and right rudder. That's all I need for a boost. And now I'm going to keep the aircraft stable with rudder and let the nose come forward. There's the nose now. And now we're on the front wheels. The tail is up. And now we're quite stable. Good airspeed, 120. Gently back on the stick, checking the nose, and that's it. And I just keep the top of the engine cowling on the horizon. Gear up. That's all there is to it. And now I'm trimming the aeroplane, a little bit of left rudder, a little bit of nose up trim. Keep the cowling just on top of the horizon. And the aircraft now is airborne. I did yaw off to the right a bit. You can see I've departed from the runway heading. I wasn't really paying attention to my heading. So there we are, airborne in the DCS Spitfire. Provided you get that sequence of events practiced, then it's actually relatively comfortable getting this aeroplane off the ground. Let's try a mishandled takeoff now. I'm going to leave the nose up trim as it spawns and I'm also going to leave the rudder trim as it spawns. So the rudder wheel um, is in that position there. I'm going to pull the stick back but I'm just going to pretty much slam the throttle forward quite quickly to full throttle and I'm going to try and get the aircraft airborne I don't think I'll have time to go through my normal sequence. I think everything's going to happen relatively fast here. I'm not entirely confident that I will be able to get this aircraft off the ground. Let's try nonetheless. Here we go. Throttle forward. Okay, that's full throttle. Right rudder. Right rudder. Right rudder. Full throttle now. Right rudder. Now I can go stick forward. Bit of right rudder. And nose is up. And I have to push forward on the stick to stop it ballooning, but we're airborne. And back on the throttle and the prop pitch, and I'm just trimming now into the flying attitude. Now to be completely honest with you, I'm a little bit surprised at how well that went. I have this feeling that 
in the past if I haven't got my takeoff procedures correct that I've absolutely balls things up. Maybe we'll put that down as a fluke. However, that was the test that I set for myself. And in fact, mishandling the takeoff didn't produce a terrible result. On the other hand, I suspect there was a lot of muscle memory at play there. I noticed that I was already reacting to the nose ballooning well before I used to. And that's purely because I'm so well versed in handling this aircraft now that um, I'm possibly just cheating a little bit there. Let's look at IL-2. In IL-2 I'm far less familiar, so once again, mistakes I make there may be just down to my lack of muscle memory and pilot familiarity. Going to conduct the takeoffs in IL-2 now, starting with the controlled takeoff. So just checking the brakes are off, full fine pitch, flaps are up. Looking at the nose trim, you'll see that it is already slightly nose down. I'm just going to set that to the neutral position. And I'm just going to move the rudder so we have about the same amount of right rudder in that we had in DCS. So our settings at the takeoff roll are about the same. And we're going to be holding the stick back, gently throttling forward. Catch the roll with a little bit of right rudder. And advancing the throttle too, we get till about the eight pound mark. Just touching in very small fractions of right rudder. Now I'm going to allow the no tail wheel to come up. There we go, tail wheel's up. I've just come right a bit there. I can actually use left rudder to steer the aeroplane around and then back on the stick. And a touch of right rudder and we're airborne. Flaps coming up. Sorry, gear coming up. Flaps are already up. That was the landing gear. We are going to conduct the poor takeoff now, and I'm going to set the aircraft out of trim. So we'll have about the same trim as we had in DCS for the poor takeoff. Stick will be fully back. Flaps are in the up position. And what I'm going to do is force the throttle forward quite quickly now and attempt the takeoff just like we did the second time in DCS. So slamming the throttle forward. Away we go. Bit of right rudder. Bit more right rudder, bit more right rudder. Okay, so once again, this is pretty easy. I can let the nose settle. I don't actually need to push the nose forward in IL-2. It actually just drops by itself. You don't really need to force it. And then we can just yank the stick back. And the trim does no ballooning at all. So despite the fact that we had plus two trim, there was really no um, response from the aircraft when the nose came up. And now we raise the landing gear. So that was actually very, very easy indeed. And considering that I have a very, very small amount of time in this aircraft compared to the DCS one, I do feel like the takeoff procedures, um, both following a correct procedure and forcing the aircraft rather poorly, both give you a very, very comfortable takeoff experience. I want to take a brief look now at throttle prop and mixture control. This will be a relatively short test because we've already covered some of this ground when we were looking at the supercharger in a previous video and I also want to have a more detailed look at manifold pressure regulation in a later video. In the IL-2 Spitfire here I'm setting the aircraft up at about a thousand meters above sea level and we are at 2500 rpm. I'm going to chop the boost back to zero boost in a second and then from there we're just going to increase the boost so we can look at how the boost gauge responds and the aircraft itself responds or the engine responds to the throttle. So there's zero throttle. You'll notice that we get a zero throttle tone from the aircraft for a short period. It's that beeping sound. Now we're at zero throttle and I'm going to push the throttle up to try and achieve zero boost on the boost gauge over there. So let's push the throttle forward and just reduce it a bit. Now during that process a few things happened. You'll notice that the boost gauge was very slow to respond. If I zero it again here and I'm going to push the throttle forward now the engine tone changes, the RPM increases 
and then the boost gauge follows. There's quite a delay in the gauge, which means you in part become reliant on the HUD and it can make you think about your boost in terms of percentage throttle rather than pounds of boost pressure which is the way you really should be thinking about it because you don't get this response from the boost gauge as quickly as you get the response from the HUD. So the HUD already tells me I'm at 44% throttle and the boost gauge responds quite a lot later. You'll notice that during the process of increasing the boost the RPM gauge goes first and then it drops back down as the boost gauge follows. From about zero boost onwards changes in throttle have a much faster response from the gauge. So if we were to go from zero to plus eight for example the boost gauge basically follows the throttle input very quickly. Looking at the prop control now, we'll set back on zero boost and 2500 RPM. If I slam the prop pitch fully forward to the full fine position, there's a relatively quick response from the propeller there as it goes fine and then bringing it back to course about the same speed all the way back to the course position. So a relatively fast and fine response on the prop. Mixture in the IL-2 Spitfire is quite different from the DCS one. The IL-2 Spitfire has a mixture lever which you can manually manipulate from full lean, which I'm at now. So that's full lean mixture. And I can go then in increments all the way up to full rich. So there's the, there's the lever moving on the left hand side and I can set this to any point along the lean and rich end of the spectrum. So that is a brief look at throttle, prop and mixture in IL-2 and the main talking point here is really that delay in the boost gauge when moving the throttle up from very low to medium boost. I'm in the DCS Spitfire here at about 2500 RPM and 1000 meters above sea level. We're going to chop the throttle in a second and then we're going to throttle back up and observe the boost gauge to see if it responds slowly or faster than we saw in IL-2. So let's do that. There's uh, zero boost and I just have to adjust the aircraft's attitude a bit because of the slightly more dramatic change here. And now increasing throttle and you can see the boost gauge just comes up straight away. And there's the RPM climb and then the RPM drop and I'm fighting here with all that extra engine torque that comes flying on. So the boost gauge moved instantaneously um, almost very very short delay behind when moving the throttle and when the boost gauge responds. This makes it a bit easier to set specific boost measures in the Spitfire. You'll notice the RPM gauge did a very similar movement. It climbed up and then settled back down as it began to be uh, controlled by the prop mechanism. So that's the main difference between this one and the IL-2 is the sensitivity of the gauge to changes in boost. We'll now just boost up and down between 0 and 8 and you can see that I can very rapidly and accurately move between the two. Now we're just going to take a look at the prop control itself. So there's course prop and it's a bit slower perhaps just spooling down. It seems to come up at about the same speed from full course to full fine. And there's a similar pace drop from the top to the bottom. So really no observable or appreciable difference in the prop control. The last thing to discuss of course is the mixture control. We have a two position mixture in the DCS Spitfire. We have auto rich which is the current position. That is the aircraft will um, automatically manage the fuel mixture focusing on having it as rich as possible. And then there is the lean position, which if I hit my key binding, the mixture lever will retard. And then we have lean mixture now, which is going to cause the engine to cut out if I leave it on too long. So I'm just going to go back to the auto rich position and have to readjust the aircraft due to the torque there. Those are the major differences between the two in terms of controls. 
what I find with the DCS Spitfire is the, the control responses, the engine responds much faster to changes in throttle and pitch combined, whereas IL-2 seems to be a lot more docile. The last thing I want to look at while we're discussing the engine controls is the effect of changes in engine settings on the aircraft's attitude and airspeed. I'm sitting here on 12 pounds boost and 2500 RPM and I'm just going to increase both boost and RPM a little bit. So we'll just push both forward at the same time and you can see that we've pretty much maintained trim. I just have to trim the nose up a fraction and a tiny little bit of left because I think the nose was already sinking but we've managed to hold the aircraft with a very gentle change in those engine settings. I'm going to go something a little bit more violent now. I'm just going to reduce the boost from its current of about 16 down to about zero. Okay and you can see that the nose started moving around quite wildly there and we've entered a right hand nose down attitude. I'm out of trim so I'm going to try and bring that back and I'm just going to move the throttle up and down a little bit at the full fine pitch position. So I'm going to get the aircraft trimmed into level flight here and I'm just going to move the throttle up and down and with my hands off the control column just watch the nose. It is moving considerably left and right and we're losing our attitude as well. With more violent changes in boost obviously we get more violent changes in the nose position. So when are you about to shoot in DCS moving the boost control around is not a good idea it really does throw off your aim considerably. We'll now do some checks of the aircraft's attitude and heading with engine changes in IL-2. I'm just going to pump the throttle and the RPM up gently from their current just to see how much of an effect that has on the aircraft's attitude. So we're just pushing them forward now. A very small amount of nose rise as the airspeed increases and we gain some lift but there's no real torque effect there at these settings and with a nice gentle change. So we'll just trim out and now we'll try some slightly more aggressive changes. Maintaining fine pitch now and pulling the throttle back. See a very small rock there. But no real change in heading. I'm just going to settle the aircraft and try some really violent changes now in boost. Once I can get this nose trimmed. Zero. Very small changes. Full. The aircraft just appears to be returning. Zero. Full. Zero. Full. Now we're starting to see a bit of nose drop as I'm losing lift. But we're pretty much on the same heading. We're a few degrees off. So the engine torque effects in this aircraft in R2 are relatively forgiving. Let's now put the aircraft into a relatively tight turn and then we'll try to look at the effects of throttle adjustment. I'm going around in a right hand turn now, zero throttle, full throttle, no, no difference really required on the rudder and you can see I'm maintaining its full throttle again, zero throttle, a little bit of nose rise there but very very tiny tiny adjustments on the rudder and it really has very little effect on my turn at all. I'm just flying around with significant changes there and we ran out of airspeed. Well I overturned just a bit at the end there and we had a wing drop. So manipulating the throttle through its full range of motion in the IL-2 Spitfire doesn't have a huge effect on your turn rate or turn stability. In DCS now I'm going to go into a similar right hand turn and I'm now going to manipulate the throttle like I did in IL-2. Full throttle, right rudder required, 
Zero throttle, left rudder required, lots of left rudder. Full throttle. Oh, and we're just about to over speed and the aircraft has now fallen out of the turn. So back into the turn again. Increase full throttle. That's full boost. And the nose is climbing zero the boost and we're already dropping inside the turn and just about to lose control of the airplane. Okay. I'm just going to get some airspeed back just in case that test was because of my low airspeed. And that is the reason why it was so difficult to make those aggressive boost changes, which we could do with quite some ease in IL2. Back into the turn then at well over 220. And I'll try and make a bit more of a gentle turn this time. So full throttle, zero, nose comes down, full throttle, I have to put right, right aileron and rudder in zero throttle. And to get the nose back on the horizon, I require considerable adjustment. Full throttle. Oh, the nose is coming up there. It's still incredibly difficult to make aggressive boost changes in the DCS Spitfire. Far, far more difficult than it is in IL-2. This also means that in combat you can't do crazy things like suddenly chop the throttle or go from zero to full boost in short amounts of time because it throws the aircraft into a very unstable condition and it's quite detrimental to do those sorts of things when flying the DCS Spitfire. That concludes part four to this series. In the next part we will look at manifold pressure regulation, the use of flaps at high airspeeds, flying with the aircraft in dirty configuration, and finally we'll take a look at landings. Thanks for watching everyone, I hope this is proving enjoyable for the few that are still watching the series. As usual, happy hunting and I'll see you up there.